Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideau, joined as always by legendary trainer and boxing Hall of Fame broadcaster, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, normally we like to exchange some niceties here, but we've got some serious business to discuss with the WBC basically allowing Oscar Valdez to go forward with this fight after a blatant PED violation. I'm not even sure we, where we begin with this. If you have a problem with some of the substances on the list, the time to get those substances removed is before your fighter test positive for them, not after the fact, and then allow him to fight anyway. Oscar Valdez, convicted of uh, having some kind of stimulant, a banned stimulant in his system, which... You know, if you're struggling to make weight and you can make it a little bit easier on yourself while your opponent kills himself to make weight, that's a huge advantage. No gray area about it. Dying to hear your take on this, but bad, bad look for the WBC to let this fight continue and go on as scheduled. I don't mean to laugh, but when did they ever have a good look? Um, you know, I mean, really, I mean, when, when does this uh, become old news because it is old news with uh, one thing or another with these organizations. This time it happens to be the WBC, but does it matter which one it is? They're useless. I mean, except they know how to take money from the fighters. You know, they know how to take those sanctioning fees. That they're, they're, they're damn good at that. Um, believe me, there would be no, uh, there would be no banned substance that would keep them from taking those sanctioning fees. <laughs> nope. that, that, that wouldn't happen. Um, Listen, he tested positive, he being Oscar Valdez, uh, for fen fentamine. Yep. And, um, and, and from, you know, we always do our due diligence. From what I understand, I caught a few people up just to know we were going to talk about this and medical people and make sure that I have all my oars in the, in the water properly. Uh, he tested positive for that. That's a central nervous stimulant. Uh, and it's used for weight loss uh, out of the things that it's most frequently used for. Um, of course, his team says it came from herbal tea. But first, first, let me just deal with that. Um, Ken, who cares where the hell it came from? <laughs> I mean, like hallucinogenics come from mushrooms, right? I mean, and you probably, you know, you probably shouldn't be taking them. So because it might be from herbal tea, and that's a big mite, as it's supposed to suggest it's okay, it's harmless, but it's still a banned substance. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's, it's, I mean, these people, they, they just crack you up. I mean, it's a banned substance. It's banned for a reason. Uh, the WBC now is saying it's okay. It's not doing anything. And they're letting the fight go on. Well, Why'd you ban it then? I mean, why you got these rules? I mean, if if you're not going to uphold the ban and suspend them, because why? It depends on who's caught doing it. I mean, let's get to the nitty gritty. I mean, is it because of who's doing it? Um, if it's someone less important who's not connected with the Canelo team and not giving you a lot of money and sanctioning fees, then maybe, maybe then... Maybe then it changes. Maybe then you stick to the rule. I mean, you want, Ken, they want to have the look that they're doing something to regulate the sport and, of course, protect the most important part of the sport, the fighters. But not really. <laughs> not really. I mean, uh, not really do anything that costs you money. God forbid they do anything that's going to cost them uh, a sanctioning fee or a relationship with the Golden Goose, Canelo. You know, that. I mean, I, I think everybody understands that. I, mean, I got a let serious me just, question for you. Go ahead. One, one thing, one thing before I forget this. Eddie Reynoso, and I didn't come here to – I came here to put facts out, that's all. Eddie Reynoso, I, I don't – I mean, he does a good job as a trainer, yeah. But he he's – He's had now how many fighters, Ken, in his Countless. camp? Has, I mean, I, I, I want to be responsible. I mean, I know three of them. You got Canelo, you got Valdez, and then you go, you go back and you got Martinez. Uh, I think it was Julio Cesar Martinez, who was a WBC 
flyweight champion back in 2019 came out of his camp too. And, and maybe there's others, but all right. So <laughs> there, I want to touch on their excuse, how they're getting a, around this. So the WBC is getting around this by saying they only ban the drug. Listen to this, Ken, in competition. And the in-competition period only begins on fight day itself. Wow. All right. Only on fight day. So you can use a banned substance to help you get ready for the fight as long as you don't use it the day of the fight. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. So let's just say that it gives you an advantage in making weight. That's okay. And why would you? I mean... And so it helps you make weight, which is not legal. So you have an advantage, something helping you make weight where you don't have to struggle like the other guy might have to. And, okay, why would you use it after that anyway? You, you use it for the job that it was going to help you with. <laughs> so so you, 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 you use it during camp. You use it during the most important week leading up to the fight fight the fight week where you have to crunch weight, where you have to you have to cut weight, which which is the first fight. I often talk about that. There's three phases to a fight, Ken. Um, the obviously you got the training camp, then preparation, but then you got the weigh in. You got you got to obviously uh, get past the weigh in, and then you have the psychological part of the stare down where, you know, you have to keep it together emotionally, mentally. And then of course you have the night of the fight. So one of the most important phases, making the weight, you're allowed to use it. Of course you don't need it anymore. So, you know, like, okay, thanks a lot. So uh, you accomplish your goal of making it weight easier all these organizations and so-called regulators of this sport, they're just a joke. I mean, you might as well do away with the rules since you don't enforce them. And it's, I, I couldn't help this. I was thinking last night when I was prepping for the show, it's like the mayor of New York City over here. Um, you know, you know, how do you like Tennessee? You like it, right? It's nice. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about moving. But it's like the mayor of New York, New York City, months ago, he instituted, and I'm not getting into politics, but I had to say this when, with, with a comparison with this. He instituted no bail rule um, for crimes. So, and this stuff, like we talk about with the WBC, you can't make it up. Well, what I'm about to say, you can't make this up either. So a guy, this is a few months ago, a guy robs a bank and he's released immediately because, you know, the new rule, no bail. <laughs> no, I don't mean to laugh. No bail. And he goes and he robs four more banks and in a week. So five bank robberies in a week, he's released each time. I mean, obviously, that judge and the mayor should be working for the WBC. I mean, <laughs> and, and their motto, the motto would come, would be come fight for the WBC, which I've often said that the call letters really stand for we be asking. Um, we be collecting. And, or we be collecting. Yeah, WBA, I get them confused. And, and also what they could also put into their new motto would be we be collecting, we just don't collect urine. You know, <laughs> put that in there. Or blood. And, and uh, yeah, and, and, and our banks are always open. <laughs> you know, the I banks are always give, open. Teddy, let me give WBC yeah. one compliment along those lines. They're, they're as thick as thieves. If you're uh, going to rob a bank, you should call the WBC to rob it with you. They'll do anything for their partners in crime, including allow them to cheat and go ahead with the fight. So oh, if they the have problem. any any compliment, it's that they're loyal to a fault. Hey, you're our guys. You're our champion. You want to you want to dope during the fight? Don't worry about it. We'll take that off the banned list, or we'll make up some cockamamie excuse that it shouldn't have been on there in the first place. The time to talk about that was before the guy started using it. The other thing I want to ask you is, this is a very wait, wait, dangerous. Wait, wait, wait. One thing I got to Go say. One other thing. 
Go ahead. I have to put the whipped cream and cherry on top of this dessert. <laughs> really, because you can't, you can't, you really can't make this crap up. And so the cherry on top is that Bob Arum, the same one who was convicted of money laundering and bribery by a federal court uh, for paying the IBF to rape fighters um, years ago, he attacks the right of Mike Coppinger for reporting the story on ESPN, which can, it happens to be Coppinger's job. Maybe he's, <laughs> I'm like, someone should have explained to Bob that that's actually his job. But anyway, he attacks Coppinger um, for doing his job. And then here's, here's one of the great quotes of, of Aram. Aram said about the positive tests when, when he was scolding Mike Coppinger for reporting it, this is what Aram said. It's nothing. Obviously referring to fentanyl. It's nothing. It's not even illegal. Um, actually, Bob, it is illegal. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a banned substance. That's why we're having this conversation. That's, that's kind of why we're in this situation right now, because it actually is illegal. So, I mean, it just it gets better and better. You said to me the other day, you said that boxing and these organizations, the WBC, all of them, they're like the gift that keeps giving. <laughs> they, just, they just keep giving you stuff to talk about. I mean, it's like they never, it never ends. And, and the force, it never shuts off. They just keep giving you stuff. It's incredible. Um, go ahead. You wanted to say something. I mean, it's just. Yeah, I have a serious question for you. Given what's gone down and we can all agree that, okay, let's say he's using it. It's fine. It's banned for the other guy, though, because we all understand it to be banned. So most of the guys are following the rules, regardless of where the source came from. So one guy has an easier way cut. One guy has a tougher way cut. One guy's the A side. He's going to get every advantage. Valdez. The sport is dangerous enough. And God forbid this should ever happen. And I hope it never happens again. But let's say uh, the opponent in this case, Valdez, hurts him and really hurts him. And he has to be taken out on a stretcher. God forbid. Well, how's that going to look for the WBC that they let a guy have an advantage that they didn't tell the other guy, hey, you can use this too. Don't worry about free for all. Anything you want. Whatever you want to do, we'll deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Either you violated the rules or you didn't. What's going to happen if someone gets really hurt here? Well, it's going to be a huge lawsuit. No, I mean, I'm being real serious. Seriously. It's going to be a huge lawsuit, and maybe the organizations, seriously, will wind up bankrupt uh, to, escape the, uh, you know, to escape the judgment. Because the family, to your point, um, they are – in a position, they've put themselves in a position, supposedly part of their duties is to look out for the welfare of the fighter. You know, it's to rate fighters, you know, it's to, it's to rate champions, to give belts out, you know, all that stuff, uh, I guess. But it's also to have put forward regulations that will protect the fighter uh, to the best of the ability that, you know, a sport that's inherently difficult and dangerous where you come up with the best remedies you can and the best rules you can um, to protect the fighter and to enforce your own rules. So just by that alone, you have a hell of a court case where a family is going to go to court and they're going to say they didn't do this. And, um, you know, they broke their own rules. They, they put my son, my husband, my, my the, uh, you know, the, my father, whoever, but they, they put him in, uh, they put him in graver risk than he should have been in. We understand the risk of the sport, but they, they put him in even graver risk. And listen, at the end of the day, um, you hope, as you said, that something like that, that tragic never happens. But in such a tough sport, you would think that sooner or later, with these organizations doing the things they do and having no accountability. I mean, really no accountability for any of their rules, you know, not even having real drug testing. We've debated this before that it's not real anyway. <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke anyway, but how much of a joke does it then become when you go and you take your own rules and you throw them in the garbage can? I mean, where your own, 
you say something is not legal and you will be suspended if you use it and then they use it and they're not suspended. One other thing I want to touch on on this subject, because as I said, I want to, I want to make sure we're as thorough as possible. Uh, Canelo tested positive. We talked about Reynoso's, uh, you know, stable fighters and some of them testing. And I'm not, I'm saying nothing, uh, I have nothing against Reynoso. He's a good trainer. And he's, maybe he's a good guy. I don't know. But all I know is that uh, Canelo tested positive for banned substance. Um, and you know more about these things Clint, than I do. But Clint Buterol. Him, yeah, Quinn Buterol in 2018. Yeah. How do you pronounce it, Ken? Clenbuterol. It's yeah. like an asthma drug, but it also has some uh, androgenic effects that act like a, almost like an anabolic steroid, definitely like a water drug, but it also can be used to mask the um, use of other performance-enhancing drugs. Bingo. So in 2018, he had to postpone the rematch with Golovkin. So that in 2019, WBC flyweight champ Julio Cesar Martinez also part of Reynoso's gym, tested possible also for the same drug that um, Canelo did, Sambuterol. So, and now, of course, we have Faldez. So that's three. I, I mean, I've heard people say there's more. I, I'm not going to say there's more unless I, I can, you know, definitely specifically point at who, who it is and what does, you know, what exactly the situation was. But I think three is... Is kind of a lot. Um, the other thing I want to touch on is that Khalid Plant, the IBF super middleweight champ, he went on a rant after seeing the news on, you know, on Valdez being cleared or whatever you want to call it, of not obviously not being held accountable um, and not being suspended. Um, he's not wrong. You know, a, a lot of fighters feel the same way, but they won't say it publicly. I, I have to give him credit. And that's obviously why I wanted to bring his name up. Um, as he says, and I have said many, many times through the years when I had the platforms I've had, this sport is already dangerous enough without putting things in your body that can make it more dangerous. And, um, you know, he has to go and fight Canelo if that fight stays on. And I also want to say ahead of time, Ken, because I kind of know how you know, how this works and how people react. Um, shame on those people on the internet if you're going to attack Plant now saying he's getting nervous or scared about fighting Canelo. Um, you know what? No. He, he's got the right to demand that he's clean. He, I mean, he's got that right. I mean, <laughs> it, they do risk everything when they get in that ring, these fighters. And sometimes, as I've said for so many years, um, on ESPN and everywhere else, fighters get in the ring and they come out of the ring with less of themselves. And sometimes they don't come out, unfortunately. So he's got a damn right uh, plant to be concerned and to be speaking up. Uh, where a lot of the, quite frankly, a lot of the fighters, a lot of people in the sport, trainers, Everyone else, they, they don't. They're afraid to. They're afraid to get on the wrong side of somebody. You know, they're afraid to get on that blacklist, if you will. Um, you know, so I give him credit for that. At the end of the day, wow. The NFL was tougher on your boy or your former boy, Ken, Tom Brady, for taking some air out of a couple of... <laughs> I have no Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah, well, let's, he's still your boy. He's still, that's my <laughs> boy, Ken. He's being loyal. That's what I like to see. Um, allegedly taking some air out of a couple of footballs that they were tougher than the WBC is for a fighter taking an illegal substance. I mean, last time I checked, Brady's not, well, he's not throwing the ball into a player's head 500 times. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, you, you just, again, I've used this phrase five times today. I use it one more. You can't make this stuff up. As you said, you know, the other day, as I already noted, uh, <laughs> they just, boxing is the gift that keeps giving. They keep giving you stuff to talk about. Ridiculous stuff that's quite frankly, um, 
we wish we didn't have to talk about it. Well, I'm surprised that um, the Reynoso camp and Alvarez camp, uh, sorry, not surprised. Uh, it's interesting that they act so surprised when Triple G was um, getting upset with Alvarez. He was acting like he was insulted. How dare you call me cheating? Well, they've been, how many times is this going to happen with that camp? And like you said, everyone's afraid to speak out about the golden goose of boxing Canelo. They're just going to let him get away. And the WBC, again, it, as evidence, is just going to let them blatantly dope, go ahead with the fight with zero repercussions. It's just, I mean, the, a couple weeks ago, we have the WBA allowing an official from their organization in the camp of their, their fighter who lost the fight. They gave him a draw. It, the whole thing is just um i want to say one other thing i want to quote one other person you know i quoted plant i just want to say my my friend um boxing misses him he was a great ambassador to the sport the late great bird sugar uh boxing writer and former editor of uh, the ring magazine uh uh as he used to say boxing has given itself another black eye but it has no more eyes to blacken. It is the Cyclops. Um, <laughs> that's, I mean, you couldn't say it, I don't think, more poetically <laughs> or succinctly, accurately, as Bird Sugar said it. Uh, it's so true. It's so true. Uh, we, I fought for, I fight for this sport. We use this platform to fight. We fight for it. I fought for it for 25 years on ESPN. When I had that platform and I don't know, sometimes you just get a little tired. That's why I wore this shirt today to remind myself to keep fighting because uh, you can't forget you have to keep fighting even when you get tired. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, obviously the shirts that uh, that Ape Man sent Ape us. Ape Man Strong. Yeah, they sent to us. Uh, they they jumped right on it. They must have heard our broadcast when I said the shirts were too small. And they jumped right on it. And bang, I got bigger shirts. I won't say what size. You know, we'll keep that to ourselves. <laughs> but they sent me they sent me larger sizes. And I'm wearing it. And I often say that we're all in a fight. Uh, it's just a matter of what do we fight for? Uh, today, we're fighting to try to help the sport of boxing a little bit and bring things forward as we try to do always. And also, as always, I'm fighting just to be a little bit of a better person every day. You know, try to keep those ninjas from coming off from over the wall. You know, those ninjas that come at us sometimes, those ninjas of convenience, of excuse, you know, uh, they, they do come, they do come. They, you know, you don't have to have, be in a prize ring. You don't have to be uh, wearing gloves, uh, as I often say, to be in a fight. So I'm just trying to be better. I appreciate these shirts to remind me of that. I appreciate you. Um, now, what do we move on to now? Can we move away from, <laughs> can we move away maybe from some of this uh some of this uh, stuff that we wish we didn't have to talk about. And you know what, Ken? Before we do, I had said that uh, Tyrone Woodley was the greatest welterweight champion in the UFC history. Yeah, I, I mean, I said it. I said it uh, very clearly, as I just did now. And I heard through the grapevine, you know, you know me. I'm not really too sophisticated. I heard through the grapevine or the Congo drums, you know, in the jungle um, and smoke signals emanating from some caves in the Tibet mountain ranges where <laughs> sometimes I, uh, I will be known to, uh, to hang out, you know, because the internet doesn't work in such regions, you know? So uh, obviously most people know I don't go near the internet. And at times like this, I'm reminded that maybe it's not a bad thing that I don't go near the Internet. Uh, so I don't see those uh, love notes that <laughs> some of our more caring fans may send, you know. But for the smoke signals, you know, I, I you know, I, I get little bits of it, little bits, little bits. I'm, I'm good at reading smoke signals. Um, but, hey, it's all part of being out there. 
in a major way as I am and as we are, you know, if you never want nothing negative or disagreeing with you, then you pretty much need to stay quiet in your room or in a basement in your underwear, as perhaps <laughs> some of these, uh, you know, some of these fans, and not all of them, not all. I'm talking to the responsible ones that have a right to say what they said. But um, some of these fans and trolls that do hang out in their underwear downstairs. Um, but in this case, it's very fair because I'm out there saying things in a public domain and you're allowed to respond, you know, you're just allowed to respond. Matter of fact, it's really what this show's about. You know, hearing our thoughts and then at times comparing them to your thoughts. But on top of that, I have to admit that I still don't have I still don't have to weigh classes down. No excuses. But um when I look at <laughs> when I look at welterweight um in MMA, I have to remind myself that it's not 147 pounds. <laughs> it's 155 pounds, you know, or, or, or so. So, um, obviously, obviously, uh, the weight classes, you know, uh, are different. And, um, in the MMA and boxing. And I, I wasn't, I wasn't really properly assessing a list of all of the great welterweights. Once I heard some of the, you know, some of the Congo drums that was kind of translated to me, I, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't really given it the thought that it deserves to be given to the fans out there and to the sport itself. Of all the great welterweights, um, you know, in, in this sport, in the history of this sport. And while Woodley is definitely at least, I'm not going back, while Woodley's definitely at least, again, in my thoughts, in the top three, I said he was the greatest, but he's definitely in the top three. Of course, that's it's always subjective. But um, of all time, I, I didn't, again, I didn't account for, for guys like George St. Pierre, St. Pierre um, who actually, I remember, was selling out arenas in Montreal years ago. I'm probably going back 20 years ago, maybe somewhere around there when I was doing the Friday night fights. He was selling out arenas when I was up there doing ESPN. I remember I asked somebody that knew about the MMA because the MMA was a lot newer back then. And I, you know, I asked somebody, who is this guy He's selling out? Like, I think there was one of them was like 40,000 people, you know? And I was like, wow. Who the hell is this guy? And back then, they're telling me, you know, they started to speak of his, you know, accomplishments and how special this guy. And even then, they were saying this guy might be the greatest, one of the greatest ever. Um, you know, and they didn't make any differentiation of the greatest welterweight. Or the, just he might be one of the greatest. So I, I didn't account for him. And I realized that. And also, obviously, um, I remember when I was up there doing the fights then, and I was, as I said, he had just been there before us, and he had sold out an arena. We were doing a fight at the Bell Center. And so, obviously, he's, a lot of people consider him the greatest. Um, I also didn't think of Usman, who's still fighting, still making his own history in this sport but he's obviously pretty dominant and special, um, you know, in so many ways. He's so physical. He's so strong. He's so mentally strong. He's so good and adept on the mat. Um, <laughs> and, you know, obviously he handles himself in the striking too. Uh, but I think on the mat, he's, you know, he's pretty much a monster. Uh, GSP also, had nine title defenses. Wow. Wow! Wow! Thanks for getting that for me. So the other, anyway, the other great, the other great one that we should mention too is Matt Hughes with five uh, title defenses. Well, the one I, I actually was thinking, and you're right, you're not wrong. The one I was thinking was we should mention maybe B.J. Penn. Um, he, I was thinking he should be mentioned too. But listen, at the end of the day, it is subjective. 
But what I'm trying to say is I recognize, I recognize, um, I heard the bongo drums a little bit, okay? And I, I recognize that I was wrong um, in a way, not wrong in saying that Woodley's the greatest. If that's what I think, hey, I'm allowed to think that. But not to put into proper context, um, George St. Pierre, you know, as I just said, Usman still making history, still writing his own history. He's not done, but he's he's when it is done, obviously he's gonna be up there. And you just mentioned Hughes, I mentioned uh, Penn. At the end of the day, Woodley for me, in anyone's conversation, belongs in the top three or four. Definitely, I, I think yeah, I, four title defenses. That's I a mean, lot. He, he belongs in the top three or four. Um, but I just, I did want to just make sure that I, you know, I just want to make sure that I gave the proper respect to these other guys. You know, it, it's, uh, it's, and and I'm I'm actually thankful that the bongo drums came a little bit, to be honest. Uh, I can handle it. You know, I can handle bongo drums. I like bongo music. I, I, I don't know. I like it. I, 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 I remember when I used to take the fighters years ago up to the South Bronx to get fights uh, in smokers, uh, to get amateur fights. Tyson was one of them. But I used to take my team of fighters up there from the Catskills uh, to the Bronx to get fights. And I remember when we used to come in there, you could hear the music as you're walking. It was quite a thing because the fighters, these kids, you know, I mean, it was a scary thing. They're going to the South Bronx. You're seeing all these blown up buildings, right? And you're seeing all, all this different way of life from where they're coming from, from Catskill, right? And waterfalls and stuff. And then you're going up there and you're seeing all this different stuff. And then you come in the building and you're trusting Teddy Atlas and your coach and he's bringing you up the steps and you're going up three flights of steps and had to be... Uh, you know, scary for these kids. I mean, uh, but yet they faced it. But the thing I was saying is <laughs> I used to, as they were walking up the steps, they would hear the bongo drums. As we got closer and closer, you could hear the bongo drums. And then we opened up the doors and there they were, these four foot bongo drums uh, and playing salsa music, you know, again, where they got, where these beautiful kids would get a chance to meet other beautiful kids from different cultures and, and mix and learn from each other. So those bongo drums, I guess what I'm saying is thank you for sending those bongo drums out to me, reminding me of uh, things I needed to be reminded of and being able to, again, do what I always want to do, respect not only boxing, but any, any combat sport and to respect MMA. And respect those great fighters like Usman and George de St. Pierre. And as Ken just said, Hughes. And as I mentioned, BJ Penn. They're all the greatest. Um, definitely Woodley uh, needs to be in that list. But all those other guys needed to be named too. They needed to be mentioned too. They've been mentioned. Thank you for allowing me to do that, Ken. And... Um, Let's, let's move forward. Do we have anyone else that has to be suspended? Um, to, <laughs> I'm, to, sure, I'm sure there is. They just haven't revealed themselves yet. Give them a few more days. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I love you, Ken, because you're right. They, it, it, it's the gift that keeps on giving, baby. Just They'll keeps on giving. I'll um, be back. I'm sure they're. Uh, I'm sure they're plotting their next move in the background. But let's talk about Lara Warrington too, from uh, from Leeds, England. I think that's where it was. Leeds. Um, like I said, Lara Warrington too. Lara shocks Warrington. Stopped him in the last fight. Warrington, for those that don't know, had the IBF featherweight title. He vacated when they were trying to force him into a um, force him into a uh, mandatory against Zhu Khan 
who then went on to lose his next fight. Warrington uh, uh, vacated the title so he could move on to bigger money fights, um, targeting the ring magazine belt, allegedly. So he abandoned, So he vacates the belt. He fights Lara, thinking that that's the next step up towards the big, towards the big names he wants. Lara shocks him and knocks him out. So they rematch um, again in England. <laughs> Credit to Lara for going back again. I can't imagine he gets a, he gets a decision there if it ever comes to that. But nevertheless, no. But he got uh, extra money. I'm sure, Ken. I mean, that's, probably. Let's be fair. Let's be fair. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, so, you know, you want to get paid. Go ahead. Yep. So uh, it goes two rounds. Accidental headbutt. Warrington's head hits Lara in the eye. Gives him a real bad cut above the eye. The referee stops it. Uh, another controversy. They rule it a technical draw versus a no contest, which has big uh, gambling implications, whether it's a technical draw or a no contest. Nevertheless, um, Fights ruled a technical draw. Uh, it looked to me in the first two rounds, tell me if you saw something different, Teddy, but it looked to me like Lara was starting to get to him again, and it almost looked like we were heading for the same type of outcome, but maybe you saw something that I didn't see. How'd you see it? I often see something you didn't see, but um, not this time. <laughs> this time you're right on the mark, my friend. You're right on the button. Um, that's exactly what I saw. It was short. It was only two rounds, uh, but... Uh, and we still had a long way to go. I get it. But just as Ken just said, I saw Lara being the stronger guy, landing the more telling punches, bringing the fight a little bit more to Warrington, and ultimately early on, but being the boss, being the boss in there. And he's definitely the stronger guy. He's definitely the bigger puncher. He was landing some good shots, throwing some big shots. Um, and he was landing some good body work, doing, you know, as I would say, putting some water in the basement, uh, in the basement of Lara. Uh, I mean, in the basement of Warrington, um, which, of course, always bows well in the later rounds. You know, it, it's like putting money in the bank. You know, you, you get. You know, you get residual effect from it. You know, you get you get some uh, interest from it uh, that pays off later when you slow the guy down. You take some wind out of his sails. So, yeah, uh, to your point, I saw Lara again very early, but I saw him being a being a boss there. And but I saw something else too, Ken. I saw I saw that he was complaining. Lara from to the referee several times in that round before the big headbutt came. Uh, he was complaining about Warrington's head. He looked at the referee, he motioned to his head. He he must have complained at least two or three times. And then after complaining two or three times, I mean, it was almost like he's, you know, like he's a mind reader or, or a future you know, suit seller, say, where he's prophetic. I mean, he's because obviously he's Warrington's coming in there a little bit heavy. They're both aggressive. So you can't, I'm not going to blame one guy so much, but here he is complaining about the head to the referee, trying to get the referee's attention. The referee completely ignored him. And then, a, you know, a minute later, we're in this situation where he's got a terrible cut. And the other thing that I found interesting and a little different was that they go to the corner. I wish the commentators would have expanded on this a little more. They really didn't. But they go to the corner and Lara is obviously the cut men start to work on the cut. And Lara is basically acting like he don't want to fight. He's, he's like lobbying for the fight to be stopped. Now, look, I didn't hear everything, but I, I know body language. And I know what should and shouldn't be going on. Or maybe not what should and shouldn't be going on, but I know what is usually going on a lot of times. And, you know, and sometimes you are getting a guy, but I recognize what it is. Sometimes you get a guy that doesn't want to go on. For whatever reason, he feels that he's been impaired. He feels that we don't know physically and mentally how he was affected by that, that headbutt, you know, uh, that, 
maybe he's not feeling right physically. Uh, maybe mentally he's lost, you know, something that you don't want to lose in the second round of a fight, some confidence where he's, where he's now hesitant about whether or not he can finish the fight properly, where he thinks it's going to hinder him, where he thinks down the road, uh, it, you know, it's going to take away from his performance. Uh, you know, maybe it's going to bleed into his eye, whatever. But obviously, I'm used to these things in a corner. I see it, and it seems like it could go one of two ways. A fighter is either saying nothing, where he's just being a fighter and letting the corner take care of the cut, or he's saying he can't see, I can't go on, or he's fighting to go on. You see that too, where, you know, and of course that's what people like to see. They say, oh, he's behaving like a champion. He's behaving like a fighter. He's saying, no, 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 uh, don't stop this. I, I want it to go on. Now, look, I am not questioning his heart in any way. And anyway, he, he's, he's a fighter. He's a warrior. What I'm saying is he might have had a damn good reason to, you know, he's got a bad cut. He knows how it impacted him. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. He knows how it impacted Maybe he feels like, hey, if this is stopped now, we'll do it all over again because, you know, I, I don't feel that for the rest of the night I'm going to be what I came here to be. Um, maybe that's what he's feeling. Uh, that's his right. That's his damn right if that's what he feels like. All I'm doing is I'm putting it out there for the fans, for us, to see it, to be aware of it, to talk about it, to say, hey, here's a guy that was worried about the headbutts before they happened. Uh, he gets the bad headbutt. And then he's, as I said, he's in the corner it looked like the fight was going to go on at first. And then all of a sudden after he's, you know, doing what he's doing in the corner, whatever he's saying, which seemed to be lobbying that for it not to go on, after doing that, all of a sudden the, then the fight is stopped. And I just, I just think that it, something happened. You know, when, when he got that headbutt, besides the obvious that he got a bad cut, that something happened to this guy because he did look like he was the boss and he did look like things were going the way he wanted to go. And then all of a sudden, uh, he did, it seemed like he didn't want the fight to continue. So, and look, he also knows that he's not going to lose. He knows that, hey, at the worst, we're going to do it again. So I, I just wanted to bring that out. The other thing that was part of a residual effect of that, Ken. I don't know if you noticed this, but the other corner, you know, Warrington's corner, started um, demeaning him. They started pointing to his heart because they saw what I saw. They saw that, that he was lobbying not to, you know, for the fight not to continue, which, again, it's his right. And I watch, see, I try to see everything. And I want, and, and maybe something that the fans didn't see to bring it out, or something they did see and they wish I would bring it out. I saw the other corner doing this, touching their, his chest, and, and they're questioning his heart, which is wrong, of course. But they want the fight to continue. Obviously, they're the home team, and they're doing this, like questioning his heart. And, and I felt sorry for Lara, you know, to a degree, where he just laughed. He went like this. Like, you know, like he just laughed it off. Like, are you, are you kidding me? Are, are you kidding me? And look, look, look at my eye. I mean, this, 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 there's nothing wrong with this. There's something wrong with this. My eye, not my chest. And not what's inside my chest. So it was, it was very interesting. There was, it's, you can get a lot out of a little. Here, here we are looking at just less than two rounds, you know, uh, complete rounds and here we are obviously putting it under a microscope and we're finding different uh you know different particles if you will uh under that microscope of what happened so uh anyway at the end of the day you know listen he uh it's a it's a brutal it was a brutal cut 
you know, and uh, probably the right thing was to stop it, most likely, anyway. Uh, Very good. Um, let's talk UFC. UFC uh, fight night at, from the Apex uh, had the debut fight. UFC debut for Patty the Batty Pimlet. Patty the Batty. Nice, nice, Patty. nice. Patty, Patty the, the Batty, Batty from Liverpool, England, can't, comes over and makes a um, huge debut, scores a big first round knockout. He was a big favorite coming into the fight. Um, big talker, uh, big personality, and he got uh, he got he got his chin checked early in that one. He got rocked early and showed tremendous composure and heart to regain himself, stay in the fight, and then finish it. I thought that the opponent there, Luigi. Uh, Luigi Vendramini could have been a little bit more aggressive in terms of jumping on Patty when he hurt him early in the first round, but he didn't. Patty comes back, knocks him out with a vicious striking. Um, how'd you like Patty the Batty Pimblet? I don't think that I understand what you're saying. That Luigi, Luigi, I'm just gonna <laughs> leave it like that. Luigi, I love that. Luigi, hey Luigi, what are you doing, huh? Luigi. So I just felt that. Um, I don't think that he really missed jumping on him. I think the reason he didn't jump on him is that this this Patty the Batty, Batty the Patty, whatever, um, Patty Pimblet, the Batty, I just think that he's got such a granite chin that he never gave him a chance to really see he was hurt. And that's mm. credit to him. I don't think it was anything that Luigi really missed the boat on. Uh, and I get what you're saying. Sometimes you do miss the boat. When a guy's hurt, that's your moment. You got to jump on him. But this this pimplet, his chin is extraordinary. I mean, it's 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 granite. And he didn't he didn't give any sign for the guy to have a chance to freaking jump on him. So uh I think maybe a star is born because first of all, you know, it's not just about being great and being at what you do. It's about being able to sell yourself. It's, it's about being an attraction, a star, a star, you know, and there's different elements to, to that happening. It's more than just being good. There's a lot of guys that are very good. They're not stars, you know, and uh, I think that part of what makes it potential for for Patty Pimblett to be that guy is he's got a great following over there in the UK, you know, the land of the crumpets and the darts. Um, my listen, my brothers and sisters, we love you. We love you. And um, yes, I put extra butter on my crumpets. Yeah, I do. Yes, I do. Um, we miss you. That's why I love this opportunity to inject you into the conversation. I do. And so does Ken, because he loves you too. And this, he's got that big following. You can see why. You know, it was his first, it was his debut for the UFC. And that's the way to make a debut. Wow. You know, great action, packed fight. Uh, where he was, as Ken alluded to, he was losing early. And as I just said, and I'll say it again, he showed an extraordinary chin, uh, taking some huge shots right on the button, right on the potato, as the old timers would say, including this caught my eye, Ken, a counter left hook that wow, 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 because he gets caught coming in. He goes come walking right into a counter left hook and those are the kind of punches that you don't usually see. I don't know if he saw it. I don't think he did. But if he didn't see it, then I have to say one more wow. Wow, wow, wow. Because usually you get dropped or knocked out, at least dropped by the ones you don't see. And he he got barely nudged. Um, so, yeah, this guy's got an extraordinary uh, – I mean, he's he's got – the Mount Rushmore of chins. I mean, this guy, <laughs> uh, he, he's got quite a chin. And he's exciting. He likes to obviously strike. That's his forte. He's tough, as most of these guys are. You know, matter of fact, I have to laugh when I say they're tough. After a while, that's kind of like, it's like saying birds have feathers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, uh, yeah, Ted. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, they're tough. So, 
okay, um, no kidding. He, he's got a ring presence. He's got that it factor, Ken, um, that I talk about, you know, going towards being a star. You know, he reminds me of the late, great Arturo Gatti, where he gets hit, which makes him more entertaining. Because, you know, that's the style that's going to provide, you know, for, for the kind of fights fans want to see, firefights, right? Action fights. And in other words, his defensive flaws, they're a good thing when it comes to, you know, drawing an audience. You know, they are. They're, they're a good thing. So, um, you know, obviously most people would rather see that kind of style then they would want to see, say, uh, Floyd Mayweather. And look, Floyd Mayweather is great. He's a defensive genius. And look, there's plenty of people that love to see that, just like they love to go to a baseball game and see a great pitcher, you know, disarm the batter um, in the ways that you can do that. But in this case, uh, I think for, usually most people would like to see the home runs. You know, they, they usually go to the park. They want to see the home runs. They want to see stuff flying over that fence and kind of the same in the ring. Um, so I, he showed he's a, the other thing he showed too, he's a great finisher. I mean, not everybody is. You see that sometimes with these really good fighters and you, you get an opportunity where they got a guy and they don't finish. And there's something, to, there's something to being a finisher. There's something to being a finisher. It's a combination of things. And, um, you know, you want to call it the killer instinct. That's the old-fashioned way of saying it. But when he, when he got him hurt, he stayed on him. He finished him. Uh, and he did it with great instincts. That's, that's what I mean about being a great finisher, Ken. Uh, and there's, there's a lot to it. There, there's a reason why there's certain guys that are better at it than others. And um, Tyson was a great finisher. Jack Dempsey was a great finisher. Joe Lewis might have been the greatest finisher of all time. Uh, definitely in the heavyweights. Uh, you know, they got somebody hurt. And, uh, you know, what's that song? Good night, Irene. You know, I mean, it was, you know, pretty much good night, Irene. But uh, this guy looked like he's a hell of a finisher. And boy, oh boy, that's that people like to see that. And as I said, he did it with great instincts where before he got, I don't know if everyone picked up on this. Ken, did you see this? Before he got the finish, when when he, he was up against the defense, you know, up against the, the, the cage, and he threw a leg kick when he was right near the fence that collapsed um, Dramini's leg just enough to impact him during the rest of the round. I mean, that's, a, that's an instinctive thing that to do that in an uncommon environment in a, with fires going on, to be able to stay that within yourself and that calm and that be able to think in that kind of deliberate sense and manner. Um, wow. 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 Um, that was great thinking and execution. Um, as I said, he showed a granite chin, the ability to think under pressure. Uh, he, he's got power. He's got those finishing qualities. He gets rid of you when he hurts you. Well, he's just a fun guy to watch. And I look forward to seeing a lot more of him. So um, one other thing I want to say, when I was talking earlier about Tyrone Woodley and his placement as, you know, in the history of greatest welterweights, there is one guy I want to definitively, you know, say, because I said, you know, I'm not afraid to say what I want to say, but I'm not afraid to say what I'm wrong either. I'm not afraid of either one. Uh, and I'm not afraid of taking some uh, some hits out there, you know. But uh, obviously, but I am going to tell you unequivocally who I think the greatest for me. Again, it's always subjective, but I don't. I dare anyone to argue with me. And actually, I say this tongue in cheek, Ken. I say this kidding because. You're going to, I know you read all, you look out for me. You're like my, my big brother, even though I'm no, a little bit older than you or whatever. <laughs> but, but, um, you know, you, I know you look out, you look at the comments. No, 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 you can't say that. You can't say that. So you're, you're always watching. You're, you're like a, 
uh, you know, you're, you're like a centurion. You're, you're a centurion uh, at the gate. And you're always looking. So maybe a few will come back when I say this, Ken. But again, I'm going to say it. Uh, for me, the greatest UFC fighter of all time, Anderson Silva. Okay? I'm gonna, I know people. some people are going to say, oh, come on, it's John Jones. I put John Jones. I'm not saying John Jones can't be 1A or 1B, or, 1B or, or number two. Or, I'm just saying, and I know it. I recognize it. And I recognize George St. Pierre. Uh, I recognize that. I recognize all of these guys. And I recognize the older guys that started this thing, like the Gracies and the Shamrocks and all those guys that, you know, started this whole damn thing. But for me, I, I, when I see somebody special, I'm, you know, and I'm looking at somebody who is special, like a Henry Armstrong, or, you know, Muhammad Ali or Joe Lewis, you know, I'm looking at that, Archie Moore, uh, I'm Sam Langford. I'm looking at these special guys for a reason that makes them stand out for me. And when I look at Anderson Silva, and I've had the pleasure of going over some of his tapes and looking at when he was in his prime, that guy stands out. That guy, that guy walks to a beat of his own drummer. That guy does what Custom Auto, my mentor, used to say, Teddy, the special ones make it up as they do it. <laughs> they make it up as they do it. That's how special they are. And, yeah, they, they, they write their own tunes. They write their own music. They're Jimi Hendrix playing the guitar. They're Louis Armstrong playing the trumpet. They hit their own tunes. And when I watch Silva... He hit his own tunes. So I, I'm, I'm opening the door for a debate. I'm opening the door for more Congo drums. I'm opening the door for more smoke signals. I'm opening the door for all of that, Ken. You with me, even Ken? If you didn't, even if you didn't open the door, the fans would be kicking it down to debate you. Anderson Silva, 10 title defenses. John Jones with 11. Um, open for debate, like you said. Um but I can tell you one thing all those guys probably were doing, and if they would, weren't, they should have been, is taking their athletic greens. And I know you've been taking yours, Teddy. I've been doing... That's why I got uh, all this energy. That's why I got all this <laughs> pent-up energy, and I'm trying to get it out. That's why. <laughs> I've been running 90 to 100 miles a week for the last four weeks. I've got four more weeks to go for the London Marathon. I'm coming to see you, Brits. But I've been taking my athletic greens every single day. I love this stuff. These guys spent 10 years with top nutritionists and doctors to create this formula. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. It's got vitamins, minerals, prebiotics, probiotics, antioxidants, like an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity system. Given that I'm going to be flying over to England, I'm going to make sure that I take an extra dose before the flight. This stuff has you covered. So whether you're looking to boost your energy levels, support your immune system, or address gut, gut health, Athletic Greens is the way to go. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Again, athleticgreens.com slash atlas. Teddy, let's hey, talk you fans about out there, you beautiful fans out there. Uh, get your signs ready. Come on. I, I, I want to see who's got the best signs to show your love for my man, Ken. Get your signs ready. Come on. <laughs> Come on. He's working his backside off. I know everybody in the race is all working hard, but nobody's working harder than my guy. I know that. Nobody. And Definitely not. My money's on him. My money's on him. He's going, I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to say he's winning. He's winning. He's good. How many? How many do you project to be in that race in your in in your um, in, category? In my yeah. category, probably couple three thousand. Oh my goodness! All right. Wow. 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 My my money's still on you. That that made me feel. You know, that's a lot. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no. Keep, I'm ready. Keep that. Keep those athletic. Do you, you, you got more, right, Ken? You got uh, more. Yeah. You got you got more of them there. Yeah. All right. I all got right, one more right, month's keep, supply, right, Rob. We're running right. low. Keep Need them ready because my money is on my Ken, uh, my man Ken. My money is on you, Ken. You're going to win it. <laughs> Thanks, You're going to win it. I'm serious. You're going to win uh, it. I'm looking all forward right. to seeing some of the fans that have reached out on um, 
on YouTube and Instagram, etc. So I'm looking forward to that. But Teddy, in that UFC fight, there was a, a vicious knee kick or knee stomp from Khalil Roundtree delivered to the leg of Modestus Buka- Bukowskis. And uh, he basically moved in like a karate style stance and uh, Khalil Roundtree stomped his knee from a side angle and uh, basically looked like it blew out his knee. I don't know if he broke his leg or just, but I mean, the fight was immediately stopped. A lot of debate online about whether those kicks should be legal. They are. But again, the time to debate that is before it happens, not after. It was legal. Both guys displayed tremendous sportsmanship after the fight, per usual in the UFC. Very rare to see bad sportsmanship over there. And um, I'm just curious if you saw it and what you think of the uh, kick there. Quite the effective tool to stop an advancing uh, opponent. Yeah, I saw it, Ken. The first thing, he, uh, you said it, you know, perfectly. He landed a sidekick uh, on... Bukowskis and um, to end the fight. But first thing was, I'm not sure why they call it an oblique kick. I, I really, that threw me off a little bit because I know, you, I don't you get that can, either. I almost, I almost uh, thought it was a typo on the tweet that we saw yeah. that someone put out because I was, but I, I saw it like a couple times and I was like, I was like, you know, I want to make sure that I'm doing this right and I'm, I know what the hell I'm seeing. So, I, I, we said it the right way. It's a sidekick uh, to the knee. And it's very, you know, obviously it's aimed specifically for, you know, to to render a guy basically useless if you if you can execute it right. But um, again, I'm not sure why they call it an oblique kick when it's a kick to the knee or obviously more specifically a, a sidekick to the knee. Um, I think they call it an. Ob- I think they're calling it an oblique kick because the definition of oblique is neither parallel nor at a right angle. So he's not like throwing a straight kick or from an angle. It's kind of at a uh, parallel. Maybe that's why because he's kicking kind of down at a parallel angle to his leg. Is that's all, like, all right. I just want to get an explanation for it, or at least put it out there to get some explanation. But that sounds good enough but i think of oblique muscles along the sides of your rib cage but um it has must have to do with the angle but clearly that's uh that's what they're calling it an oblique kick because it's maybe the stomping angle it's not really a kick as much it's as much a stomp as it is a kick well i listen i also you know to cover this i wanted to just wanted to delve into it a little bit and i did uh doing as we always do our due diligence on it and uh I know John Jones, the great John Jones, um, from what I understand, he, he has used that that kick also. He um, loves that technique. Yeah. So, listen, I can see where people are saying it should not be legal because of how damaged it can be, but it is legal. You said it. You know, I couldn't say it better than you said it. It is legal. And um, he executed it perfectly. And obviously, it's a brutal business. I mean – you know, you don't need me to tell you it's a tough business. I mean, you can pretty much do anything other than gouge the guy's eyes, um, you know. Um, also, no 12 to 6 elbows. You can't basically slam your elbow down, straight down onto someone. Yeah, all right. That, that's, that's, that's good to know. Um, that's, that's, that's good to know. Um, that's, that's gentlemanly of, uh, that's of, of them not to do that. And, and listen, if you say it's too brutal and damaging a kick, um, well, and it should be eliminated, then I think that you have to also think about eliminating the kicks to the shin area, the Mai Tai techniques, where we've seen the leg break like a tree branch. I mean, yeah, multiple we, times, we, multiple times, exactly. Multiple times. So, um, you know, it's basically a compound fraction. It's a nasty thing to witness. So um, should, you know, should they also be stopped? So if you're going to go one place, then you got to think about, okay, are you ready to go to these other places? And again, it's an inherently brutal, dangerous sport, uh, just like my sport is, boxing. So um, it's, it's obviously part of the sport, very, very difficult, tough sport. Um I also have to mention, I have to mention this, Ken. Uh, I, I just want to mention the class of both warriors. Uh, Bukowskis for sending a tweet out congratulate, congratulating Roundtree and, 
asking the fans not to attack him, not to be too tough on him on the internet. That's right. And how classy Roundtree was going into the locker room as Bukowskis was being put on a stretcher to see how he was. You know, it's just uh, it's a reminder. You know, as savage, you know, it's controlled smart savages, but as savage as these guys can be in that cage, that's how classy they are afterwards. They they really behave like men of honor. Um Heartbreaking loss for our man Darren Till. Darren Till, if you're listening, we're huge fans, especially our producer Rob Moore. He loves this guy. We all we we all do, but Rob really likes Darren Till. Uh, another Liverpool guy like Patty the Batty. Unfortunately for Darren Till, heartbreaking. Like I said, I really do feel bad for him because I love the guy. Fourth loss out of his last five fights. Um, he was just matched badly against Derek Brunson in tough. Derek Brunson just a beast in the in it in the with the wrestling skills. Uh, he manhandled Darren all night, beat him up, choked him out. Um, tough one for Darren. Right after the fight, he tweeted out a picture of um, Charles Oliveira and Michael Bisbing as an examples of two guys that suffered losses, stayed with it, stayed with it, and became champions. I hope Darren gets back on the winning track. We'd love to have him on someday. Nice guy. And cred- all credit to Derek Brunson. Incredible toughness, like I said. He manhandled them all night. Um, good fight. Bad match of styles if you're till in the till corner. Great matchup for Brunson. How'd you like that fight, Teddy? Uh, you know, uh, it's only a great matchup for Brunson. I'm going to jump on that right away. Yeah. Because he made it a great matchup. He he was having trouble standing because Till was, yep. Till was bringing it to him standing. Till was keeping him in spots where he was, you know, winning spots where he was standing. They were both southpaws where Till was keeping him at the end of the southpaw jab and then you know, land in the left hand and uh, well, shake it up. Let me say. And hurt let me say one other thing before you continue is that, it, to Till's credit, he went nip and tuck, life and death with uh, Robert Whitaker, who's about to fight for the title, who's also given given Israel Adesanya all he can handle in there. So Till, I feel like he's like right on the cusp, and he's just had a couple bad breaks, bad matchups, but like he, he he could be in the contention for number one contender just as easily as he's having his fourth loss. It's it's really unfortunate because I think he's probably one of the top three to five guys in that division. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, no, but but that if is a big if, you know what I mean, Ken? Because there's a lot in between those ifs. Yep. You know what I mean? I get it. I get it. You love him. I love him. Rob really loves him. We love his, you know, what he brings every time he gets inside that 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 cage, which is a dangerous place and a terrifying place to get in. And he gets in there uh, and brings it. But you know that old saying. I won't complete the whole thing. But if my uh, <laughs> if my aunt or uncle or something, I don't know. But but anyway, um, I'll get back on track over here. Uh, and what I was saying was, yeah, tough style at the end, definitely for for Tilt. But uh, and you know, but at the end of the day, tough style for both. They both had to overcome the other guy's style. Because yep. Brunson had no walk in the park, especially at the end there. He he got hurt. He 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 was in trouble at the end. Then he turned it his way. He got what he needed by getting the the shoot and the takedown. But um, but he Till had those moments where again a southpaw keeping him at the end, as I like to say, you know, setting the table with the jab and eating with the with the power punch. He was setting the table with the right jab and eating with the left hand. And he was having success, controlling range, doing that. Where he didn't have success, where, he, where it really went bad for Till, was that he had no answers for the takedowns. He had no answers for the shoot. Um, you know, and it reminded me, uh, you know, I'm no, I don't pretend to be uh, an MMA expert. Uh, my PhD, if I'm allowed to say that, obviously is in, in boxing and in the fight game in general, the realm of the mental realm of what, it takes to to be able to keep those ninjas from coming over the wall and attacking you when you're in uh, an environment such as a cage or a boxing ring. That's parallel. There's parallels to that in my business where anything that you do where you're threatened, where there's a risk to your, to, to your body and your soul, that is where you must understand the mental dimensions uh and i understand those dimensions and that doesn't change 
that doesn't change whether it's MMA, whether it's you know whether whether it's boxing. That that's and that's where I try to put all my you know my eggs into that basket. Where again, I don't pretend to be a jujitsu expert or grappling expert out on the floor. My stuff is when they're standing, but also what's standing in here, in between their ears. That that's that's my turf, and. What I'm saying is when for just like guys like Adesanya and to Masvidal, their strengths is striking for the most part. But both of them, both of them, in order to get to the top where they've gotten to, especially Adesanya, you know, he, he's, uh, he's the middleweight champion of the world. But, and, and of course, uh, uh, of course, Masvidal is right up there at the top and uh, been involved in some of the biggest fights. But both of them, and he's probably one of the top three attractions in the sport right now, but both of them, they improved and learned. They, they might never become the greatest on a mat, jiu-jitsu or grappling or wrestling or whatever, but they improved in those areas where their defense against the takedowns have become damn good. Damn good. They, they, that will never be their forte. Their forte will remain standing and striking and, and with the kicks and everything else and being able to mix that stuff together. Masvidal is like Bruce Lee sometimes. And so, so is Adesanya. I mean, he's like, He's like Roy Jones. He when Roy Jones was 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 great, you know, with with all his talent and his instincts and his his reflexes and his quickness, he could do things that look like they're wrong, and he could make them right. You know, uh, the only guy who really matched that was Muhammad Ali. But Roy Jones uh, had a period where he was he was doing that, and Adesanya is along that same kind of you know within that kind of mode that he does that. So the thing that I'm saying is both of these guys, although they're never going to be great on the floor, on the mat, it's never going to be, as I said, you know, their, 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 their forte, but they knew that they had to get good enough there to at least defend against the guys that are really good there, that, that try to get you there. Because they're going to try to get you there. They're not going to stay in your environment, in the striking environment if they can help it. They're going to try to get you to their environment. As I always talk about, the geography of the ring or the geography of the cage. That's what it's all about. Who owns the geography that best suits their assets? So to the credit of Adesanya and to the credit of, of Masvidal, they, they got really good at defending those takedowns. And when they are down, how to get back up. And that's something that Till really, if he's going to go on, as you talked about, he's got to improve in that area because that's the area that really hurt him in this fight and has hurt him. Because in his last, you, you said it well, he's lost four of his last fight. I believe two of those are submissions. And obviously, you know, that, uh, that means he was on the floor. He, you know, he, he was on the mat where it's not his strength. So, He's got to get better, just like those guys got better. He, he's got to get better. He's got to find a way to get the right instructors, the right trainers, you know, the right people to improve him in those areas. Um, for me, at least, from what, from what this guy sees, you know, there's this caveman in the MMA world, but I still, I'm not a caveman in the fight world. And, uh, you know, so I, I can clearly see that that's something that has to, has to happen uh, again to the credit of Brunson. You know, he survived, you know, he, he survived the striking. Uh, he got hurt. And then what did he do? He, he did what he had to do. He, he, he got into the legs. He got inside. He, he got, he got till to the floor and he was magnificent. Oh my God, Brunson is so physically strong, Ken. I mean, anyone can write. You don't need uh, Teddy Atlas, you know, whether I know MMA or not, to recognize how damn strong this man is. I mean, 
and how smart he is. I don't care if I, I might not have a PhD, as I said, in grappling, but I know what it looks like when it's damn good. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and he does it damn good. He does it damn good. He is smart. Oh my goodness. He is on that floor. That's his, he is good. He is smart. He is dedicated there. Um, you know, as I said, he's physically strong. Uh, what the hell did he do at the end there? You know, I watched the Nature Channel once in a while. And, and the last time I saw something like that, I saw an octopus smothering a fish. Uh, <laughs> or, really, I'm not, Ken, it was like he, the octopus put his membrane, you know, over the poor fishy and, and just smothered that poor little guy or whatever it was, a frog <laughs> or some kind of turtle, whatever, whatever it was. He, he, I know we're going to have petter after us. I know it. They're going to be pulling up. And so he smothered this thing. Well, that's, that's what Brunson looked like. Brunson looked like that octopus on the Nature Channel. He put his arms around him when he had him on the floor. And, oh, my goodness, he, he just took the oxygen out of the ring, out of the room. And I have to say, because I always like to, as I say, try to touch on all dimensions, on all dimensions, the obvious and the not quite as obvious. And to do that, I'm, I'm going to touch on what you started with, that, of course, he's lost four of his last five, too. But I'm going to add something that didn't go into that when, when you first said it. Can I give you he one thing four, be, be, before you do it? Let me just, just say, okay. I want to just tell you the four people he lost to for context. No, no, no. For that's people. A, you'd steal my okay. thunder. Uh -huh. You'd steal oh, sorry. my thunder. <laughs> See, you went to college. I didn't go to college. But I'm still not. <laughs> I still don't let guys get the jump on me. I still. I, I would not never to try college. to get the jump I, on you. I, I just try to give all to the intel. I know you went to college. I know that you. And, and you're Barely. still enough not to put all those degrees up on the wall. That's nice <laughs> of you to make me feel even more, you know, more whatever. But that's one area I have to I, disagree. But, I barely but, went to college. But but I but I but I might not have went to college, but I went to school. I went to a school, <laughs> uh, the custom model school, the other schools that I went to uh, that have taught me a little bit about this game. So what I want to say in all seriousness is that. It wasn't right, and you, of course, jumped on it because you're you're smart. You knew right away. Let me make an adjustment here, but I'm not letting you make that adjustment. I'm going to get it out there. <laughs> Where it's not right to say Till has lost four of his last five. Yeah, but what you'd really have to say is he's lost four of his last five to all top top guys. I mean, top guys, um, and he's lost two of them by submission, one by knockout. And the other loss was a decision to Whitaker. You talk about top guys. And three fights ago, he beat Gastelum. Talk about another top guy. He beat him. So it's a split decision. So I understand you and Rob, and you're on the button, Ken. I understand where you're just saying maybe he comes back, he refines himself. I get it because you see that and you say, this guy's been in there with monsters. Monsters. So... This is my analysis. This was a bad loss. And I know he's only 28 years old. Am I correct? I want to make sure I'm correct about that. Yep, 28. All right. But you don't judge a fighter's age chronologically in my, in my business. Um, and I don't think you do it in this business either. Um, you judge it by the amount of tough fights they've been in and what that's done to them physically and psychologically. And that's where I'm going right now. He's in a bad place, perhaps mentally right now, not just physically. Um, um, like I said, you know, I this is something that is my domain, you know. And Brunson, Brunson is a beast on the floor, you know, so strong and smart. Um, but, and as I just said, he enveloped, he enveloped till like the octopus, just take it all air away. But, and, and I have to say what I see and I have to say it, even though sometimes you're sensitive to, to people and to a guy like Till, who I respect enormously, enormously. But I have to say that 
he seemed to tap out fast. And, and uh, I'm not, again, I'm not pretending to you guys out there uh, to be an expert. I said it enough. I don't have to say it again to be an expert down on the floor. I'm not. But my expertise comes in other places. And I just see this guy has the look of a, a broken guy, a guy that, that is beaten down. I, I just mentioned, I just mentioned the, 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 the animals that he's been fighting. And I say that obviously in a respectful way. The, these, these great guys. Matter of fact, Ken, this is the perfect spot. Go ahead, mention those guys. Mention, mention the names. So he lost to Tyron Woodley <clears throat> by submission. Again, a sick wrestler, jiu-jitsu guy, just like Derek Brunson. He got knocked out by Masvidal, got caught cold and just got put to sleep. Then he beat Kelvin Gaslam. Then he lost to Whitaker in a unanimous decision. Light nip and tuck that one. Hell of a fight. And now he just lost to Derek Brunson. And the one thing I'll say to you about the submission that he gave up, it's, it's almost like an... Uh, uh, some uh, a silent agreement when he's getting manhandled on the ground he's getting smashed with elbows and punches it's almost like a subliminal like just just choke me and get it over with like put me out of my i don't want to keep getting mashed up and it happens people just roll over and like subliminally let the guy but it can't happen the guy but Ken, that's where exactly it can't happen not, exactly not but if, i think that's not, what you're getting not if at you're is in this business at this level it can't happen yep it can't right. happen and that's but you can see no, that I get it. And that's why I'm like, bringing it, this analysis in this way yeah. that for me, he was fine standing. He was fine. There was nothing physically wrong yep. with this guy. Nothing. But he had the look like almost like when you get a look of like somebody who's abused, like God forbid, you see a kid who's been abused and, and like, their confidence is gone and they're, and, or, or, you know what I mean? Like they, they don't, uh, he, like a broken, beaten down guy. He had the look of a guy whose spirit has been cracked, whose spirit has yeah. been broken. That's what I saw. That, that's, that's, that's what I make a living at doing. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I listen. I feel the way I always feel when I see that. That I think I know what I'm seeing, and I and I understand, and I feel bad because this guy is one of those warriors that we have so much admiration for. But on this particular night, he looked like one of those warriors who has um, been in one too many tough one, and he. He's got cracks. He's got some cracks in his armor. Uh, and the one part of the armor that you that you cannot have cracks in, your spirit. And, you know, do I pretend to be in his body when he was being enveloped the way he was, like an octopus enveloped somebody um, and takes the oxygen away? No, 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 no. But, um, but it was fast. It was, it was fast. And um, so... What I'm saying is that that has to be uh, rectified. That has to be fixed. That has to be looked at, whether it means taking time off, whether it means uh, staying away from these, these top, top guys, give them a little break. You know what I mean? Give them a little bit of a break. Um, you know, maybe give them a guy who's not that good on the, on the mat, a guy who's, you know, good striking, but not good on the mat. Maybe give them that kind of guy. Uh, I don't know if he's if you're gonna have the liberty of that in in this business in the UFC run by Dana White. I, 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 you're probably not. I don't know, but but I recognize what Rob does. I recognize what you do. Uh, I recognize all of it. That this is a guy you root for. This is a guy you want to see come back. He's as I said, he's only 28. But uh, but to come back, you have to recognize where he is, what he's coming back from what he's coming back from, wh where he's at. And I think I recognize possibly, or at least I'm trying to bring this out on the show, you know, something that normally wouldn't maybe be brought out, that he's, he's in a bad place 
mentally. That's a great point that you just made. And I think one that like I hadn't even considered and I talk to you frequently. And I think that a lot of fans, if they listen closely to what you're saying there, will have a deeper understanding and appreciation for these types of scenarios because your heart does break for till and you realize it's not just a loss. There's something might be, there may be something bigger going on beneath the surface. And um, even like I said, even myself, when you just said that, I was like, you know what? That's a great point. I, I, I see that. Now that you say that, I, I'm seeing that. And listen, I would never suggest someone gives up or quits in a fight. We don't know what their decision is, but you could make the argument. There's, there's been multiple situations like that. I would argue that when Nate Diaz was smashing Connor in the first fight, in their first fight, and Connor rolled over into his belly and gave up his back and got choked out, it was almost like you could make the argument of like, I've had enough punches to the face. Just choke me. And let's get this over with and we'll try again another time maybe. But, um, yeah, heartbreaks for Darren Till, but that's a gr- good point, and I think a lot of people will get a lot out of listening to that um, to that explanation as to what was going on there. Yeah, the, uh, I, yeah, I, I hope so, and that's why I did it, and that's why we do this. Um, we want to bring light to things that need, you know, some light brought to sometimes, and um, we wish him nothing but the best. And uh, I, I'll just – go back to Brunson a little bit that boy he is so good at dropping those levels are you guys impressed with me using that terminology oh. dropping the level dropping yes. the level dropping the level <laughs> level change level change <laughs> level change <laughs> right say like these the things. way he shot yeah. in uh. the way he got down super low almost like at the height of his ankles uh Till's ankles and he shot in so quick and got a double leg on him it was it was it was impressive but it had the look of like an elite high level wrestler who oh by the way has a black belt under uh, my friend Henzo Gracie in New York so he's got the ground game is intact he yeah. could work on his hands a little if he wants to fight Izzy but He's got the ground game. No, he, he certainly does, Ken. And um, and again, uh, I'll just finish by, you know, emphasizing that, uh, you know, he, he uh, well, first of all, that Till really had him hurt. I mean, he hurt him twice at the end. Yep. He hurt him twice with the left hand, you know, set it up, like I said, on the outside with the jab. And really caught him at the end of the punch. And that's where you can do the most damage. Where you catch a guy at the end, all the way at the like you you get full extension, you get everything, you get your back, you know that's your power punch. So it's with your back foot, so you can turn into it, you can get everything into it, and you get full extension. So you catch him really, really solidly on, on, on the end of it like that, with everything behind it. So he he really, I mean, Brunson's got a good damn chin too, and um, so he he hurts him. But then, like I said, immediately, immediately, <laughs> Brunson knew what he had to do. You know, he had to get out of this striking position. And he had to get in yep. to where he could be the boss and where he is the boss and where he's the king. And he did. And um, he did it. He did it quick. He did it without hesitation. And um, as I said, I hope that Till can get out of the place that I believe he may be in a difficult place mentally right now with his confidence and everything. Um, And if he is going to come back, not only does he have to get out of that place mentally, that's the key, but he also has to, and I think it's worth repeating, improve, you know, in the area of at least, you know, again, he's never going to become a Gracie, if you will, a legendary guy on the mat. But he's got to at least go along the lines of a Masvidal, as I said earlier. You know, and and a uh, and a um, uh, Masvidal and the um, and Alessandra. He's got to at least go along those lines of getting improved. I don't know if they get as good as they got, but at least improving in the area of defending the takedowns, you know, he, he's got to get better in those areas because that, that floor is, is just, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a floor that everyone sees and it's a floor that has to be corrected. You know, it's, it's it has to be corrected. Um, if he's going to come back and obviously compete at, 
the levels that he's been competing at, you know, where these guys are their masters in that area. Yep. Well, Teddy, we've got uh that was a great breakdown, I think, of the limited action that we saw this weekend. We've got um not much happening next weekend. There is that um Oscar Valdez fight, obviously, and all joking aside, for like the WBC sake and the sake of boxing, I really hope that there is no uh, that no one gets hurt in this fight, even coincidentally, because it's a terrible look to let a guy use drugs that other guys aren't being able to use. Cool, you want to let them use it? That's fine. Take it off the list and make sure everyone can do the same stuff. And along those lines, I'd say if there's banned substances out there that fighters, promoters, sanctioning bodies don't want on the VADA list, now's the time to discuss it. It's like the sprinter Shikari Richardson smoking weed and getting kicked off the Olympic team. If you know the drug is on the list, don't do it, especially if you know you're going to be tested. If you don't think it should be on the list, that's a different discussion. Getting caught and complaining is not the time to debate whether it's legal or not. I can't go drive 60 in a 20 and then get a ticket and say, it's, that's 20 is way too slow here. It should be 60. Okay, well, tell it to, the, tell it to your local policymakers. For now, you got a ticket. The end. Um, so hopefully the fight goes off without a hitch and no one gets hurt for the WBC sake mainly. Um, but other than that, not much action coming up here, but we've got obviously a big heavyweight fight coming up in uh, um, next month with Fury. You know what? And, I'm uh, going to correct one Wilder. thing. I know you didn't even think about it, sure. but not for the WBC's sake. I could give a damn about Good the point. WBC. For the fighter's Fair sake. Fair point. For the fighter's sake. Yeah, I misspoke. Yeah, it's okay. Right. For the fighter's sake. Exactly. I know what you really no, mean. I'm glad you corrected yeah. that. Not the, yeah. the other thing is, I will say, is we have the American debut on that card. Um of Junto Nakatami, um, they're fighting the WBO flyweight title. That kid is really good. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing that. He's got some good buzz. Japanese fighter. Um, other than that, <laughs> not much more to say about that. I mean, this crazy, crazy. Like I said, the gift that keeps on giving. They give us something to talk about, even on a slow weekend. So it'll be interesting to see how that how the that fight plays out with all the. Um, with all the controversy surrounding it in Tucson, by the way, the local sanctioning body or governing body for that um, for that fight was an Indian tribe athletic commission who, quite frankly, should also like take a look in the mirror and, and ask themselves if you're going to apply the rules of, a, of an anti doping body, stick by them, have a backbone. I know it might cost you a little bit of dough, but have some integrity. That's what it's all about. 100 percent. I agree with you. Um... You're talking to the choir here, brother, but I'm I'm with you. I'm with you. Yep. Well, thanks for doing this on Labor Day, and shout out to the U.S. Postal Service. I just saw them dropping my mail off on Labor Day Monday. Aren't they great? Aren't like they the great? These these people <laughs> really. They they are. Is the post office got to be like one of the biggest modern miracles? For twenty five cents, I could put something in the mail and get it delivered to like Kabul, Afghanistan, in the next week or two. It's crazy, <laughs> and it gets there every time I mail something. I'm like, they're never gonna get this. I'm always surprised when anything arrives. Uh, could you start, Ken, for the sake of the people you're sending to and everything? Could you start sending maybe priority, please? So like, uh, go for the extra couple, please. <laughs> Ken, just a little bit, a <laughs> little extra, just a little priority. Of first, course. Call first class, Ken. First class priority. <laughs> yup. Well, Teddy, again, thanks for doing this on Labor Day. Thanks to our producer, Rob Moore, for always working on Rob's the weekends the and holidays. We, 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 uh, we got a good three-man team good here team. for those that don't know. My man Rob Moore is always behind the scenes getting everything done with sponsors, production, editing. I think the guy spends about 12 hours after every episode edited, editing it and getting it up uh, on YouTube. So and he drinks, shout out to and the he drinks a lot Moore. of athletic greens. <laughs> no doubt. Rob takes more supplements than I do. That guy's the uh, biohacker of the century. If you have a problem, Rob knows how to fix it. All naturally. <laughs> That's Valdez the key. Uh, and ask him about herbal D That's to the take. Key. I'm glad you threw that in there. Of course, no, of course. We welcome testing. Rob, Anybody be... want to come test over here? Come Let's on, go. bring those little <laughs> bottles. Come <Yep>. on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thanks again, Teddy. Guys, thanks for being with us. Do us a favor: support Athletic Greens. Subscribe to the show. Leave some comments. Tell us what else you want to hear about. What else you disagree about? Who's the greatest in your mind? And maybe we'll do Edison an episode on Silva. the greatest UFC fighters. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for being with us.